Item number six. Water supply update and adoption of resolution establishing revised water conservation regulations. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council Members. My name is Kelly Dyer. I'm the water supply manager and I'm here to provide a water supply update and recommend adoption of a resolution establishing revised water conservation regulations. So first I will discuss the drought status, uh, provide uh, information on the supply strategy and discuss extraordinary conservation. So the current drought we've been in since 2012, we've experienced the five driest consecutive years on record. Um, and even with the recent rains, we're still in a drought. Um, we've had a lot of challenges and I think we've been very successful uh, in making it as far as we have, but there's still a ways to go in recovering from the impacts of drought. So I wanted to take a look back at where we've been. Uh, in February of 2014 is when the stage one drought condition was declared. At that time, we had a voluntary 20% water conservation target. Shortly after, in May of 2014, the city declared a stage two drought and changed the conservation from voluntary to mandatory. A year later, the drought conditions had persisti persisted and worsened, and a stage three drought emergency was declared in May of 2015. The mandatory conservation target was increased to 25%. Another year of drought persisted, and in April of 2016, the stage three uh, drought condition uh, was amended to increase the con uh, conservation target to be 35%. And most recently, in December of 2016, the uh, conservation target was increased to 40%. Um, that was with forecasted uh, shortages during our peak demands of summer of 2017. We were uh, projecting to have some issues with our summer demands and enacted a lawn watering ban in anticipation of that. This is a chart of recent rainfall so here you can see in 2012 through 2016, we had well below average rainfall. This is at Gibraltar Reservoir. Uh, the average rainfall is about 28 inches. In 2017, we've had slightly above normal rainfall. This hatched mark was from the major storm that we had February 17th and 18th. It was almost 10 inches of rain. And but for that one storm, we would still be below normal rainfall. So has the rain helped? Yes, it has in short, but we're still in a drought. Uh, at the beginning of our water year, most of the state was uh, in an exceptional drought. And just a few months later, Northern California had quite a bit of precipitation and our area was the only remaining area in California in exceptional drought status. With the rains in February, conditions have improved, but we're still in a drought. So now Gibraltar is full. We have the city's the only, it, Gibraltar is the city's resource. Um, Kachuma, which is a shared resource, is partially full, um, but our groundwater basins are at historic lows and it takes several years for our groundwater basins to recover. This is a chart of uh, Kachuma Reservoir storage, and the black line is the storage from the last drought. Um, you can see it got pretty low, or I'm sorry, the green line is the last drought, 1986 to 1993. And this was the March miracle, which didn't fill the reservoir a year later uh, was when uh, we recovered from the drought. The black line is where we are now. Um, so here we are today. And you can see the reservoir levels for Kachuma are approximately the same as they were in 2014 when we began this journey of the drought. So um, we don't know if this year will be followed by wet years or if it will be followed by dry years. 
So we're planning in the event it's followed uh, by dry years. This is a comparison of our overall water supplies. In 2014, we had a full allocation from Kachuma. This year, we ha uh, have started off with a zero allocation, and we anticipate a partial allocation by April 1st. Uh, this is assuming a 40% allocation from Kachuma. We'd have 3,300 acre feet. In 2014, we had 2,700 acre feet of carryover in Kachuma. This year, our carryover is currently zero, but that's what I would expect. Uh, we haven't received an allocation from Kachuma for quite a while. The last time was October of 2015, which was a 45% allocation. And that was followed by two years of zero allocation, so um, not much water to carry over. Gibraltar was at about 400 acre feet. It's now full, and we plan to use about 3,300 acre feet of that supply through the rest of this water year, which is September. In 2014, the entire state was uh, in a the entire state was in a drought, and we had a 5% allocation from the state water project, which is the lowest ever seen. This year, we have currently a 60% allocation, and that's expected to increase. We had um, 2,500 in storage. This is around at San, San Luis Reservoir, and we currently have about 3,500 that we could use um, this year in storage. Um, and then a big difference is in 2014, our groundwater basins were full. Our downtown basin was full, and Foothill was at about 80%, and so they were arrested. Now they're at historic lows with our downtown basin and Foothill basin uh, with about 30% of the remaining yield available. Um, those yields are based on, the, on a modeling study by the USGS. They have a detailed gr uh, numerical groundwater model that we use to estimate the remaining yield. And we've been working with USGS for decades collecting information on groundwater levels and water quality. So I wanted to show you some of that data today um, we have about 60 monitoring wells for water levels, and so I've just selected a few representative ones for today. Um, this is the Foothill Basin, and the red down at the bottom is city pumping, and the green is pumping by La Cumbra, the other major uh, known pumper in the Foothill Basin. Um, so this is the last drought when you see this dip down in water levels. And then after the last drought, the city um, reduced its pumping and the groundwater basin pretty much recovered after about 10 years. And then here we are in the current drought and you can see our water levels are roughly the same, slightly below where they were in the last drought. This is storage unit one. So here's the last drought where there's the dip in water levels. This is in the upper producing zone and th on the right is in the lower producing zone where you see the dip in water levels. Um, after the last drought, we had very limited pumping to recover the basins. It took about five years for the water levels to recover and here we are in the current drought. We also are monitoring for chlorides, which um, is an indicator of seawater intrusion. So we have a monitoring network, and this well here is located very close to the coast. Um, we measure chlorides at various elevations within the groundwater basin. Um, we had seawater intrusion in the last drought, which is on the left hand here, and then you can see it, um, return to normal, and then here we are in the current drought with some seawater intrusion occurring right at the coast, which was expected. This is a little further in, about halfway between the coast and 101, we have a monitoring well. And this is the well where once we see chloride concentrations increasing, we expand our monitoring program. We add uh, additional wells and also increase the frequency that we're sampling. So uh, this was the last drought, and then you can see the chlorides reduced over time, and now they've gone up a little bit. And finally, this is the uh, well near the 101 where 
Um, we really don't want seawater intrusion reaching this far. Um, once it gets to the 101, we would consider turning down our wells because we don't want it getting any closer to our production wells. Um, and as you can see, there's uh, no indication of seawater intrusion occurring near the 101. You have a question, Mr. Hart. Yeah, why is there apparently less seawater intrusion than the previous drought levels when the water table is lower? The, the basins have been hit harder with this drought and the pumping than last time. Madam Mayor, Council Member Hart, that's a great question. Um, it could be that I'm not, the water levels we were looking at might be in different locations slightly from exactly where our chloride concentration, chloride wells are. Um, but generally, it's a function of the amount of fresh water that's mixing with the seawater intrusion. So, um, seawater. And <coughs> it, the concentrations can vary. What we're worried about is the trends. Mm -hmm. So, once we see the trends going up, we know there is some level in, of intrusion occurring. Um, but so it could just be that the monitoring wells we're looking at are at slightly different locations. Okay, thank you. So the role of desal, something that's different from 2014, we now have desal coming online. It's a truly local supply. Um, without desal, groundwater is our only truly local resource. All of our surface water comes from the other side of the mountains. And so if there's any interruption in surface water, we'd be relying on groundwater. And now we'll have desal as well for drinking water. It's an important part of a diverse water supply portfolio. Having a diverse water supply portfolio helps us weather the droughts and the emergencies that we experience. Um, the desal plant is a drought supply by policy based on the long-term water supply plan. Our permits allow for it to be operated in non-drought conditions as well. Um, and after this drought emergency ends and our ground, groundwater supplies recover, we'll want to reevaluate the role of desal in our water supply. So the desalination plant was approved by City Council to be reactivated in July of 2015, and it's been uh, less it's a very complicated project that's been completed in less than two years. Um, major construction is complete, and we're currently in the testing phase. Water is being brought onshore and being run through the filters, um, and so it takes a while for the media to mature, but we are in the testing phase at this point um, with the plant hopefully coming online in April. So in summary, the drought's not over. Kachuma is at 2014 levels when the drought first became serious, and we're planning for this year to be followed by two dry years, um, and the drought impacts will last for several years, five to 10 years for our groundwater basins to fully recover. So for our water supply strategy, we're looking three years out. This is consistent with what the state is requiring for conservation requirements. Um, with the recent rains, we now have Gibraltar full, and we anticipate a partial allocation from Kachuma on, on April 1st. And some main points I wanted to get across is with um, those recent rains, we're able to postpone uh, a decision on desal expansion and the conveyance pipeline um, until a later date. It extended that timeline. So at this point, we're um, not pursuing any funding uh, for the conveyance project, although it may be something that we do in the future. Um, we are resting our groundwater basins. At this point, we've turned off all of the wells in the Foothill Basin, and we've turned down our Ortega groundwater treatment plant as low as it can go, and expect that to be offline in the next couple of weeks as well. We plan to continue to operate desal at 3125 acre feet per year and continue some level of extraordinary conservation. This is the uh, outlook for our water supply strategy. So we are currently in year six, which is 2017. And I'll start from the bottom. We have recycled water that's online and supplying water. We have our Kachuma project, which 
um, the little bit of Kachuma water that's shown here was actually carried over. That's what we used from October through December earlier this year. Um, the light blue is Gibraltar water. So you can see we're maximizing Gibraltar deliveries right now. If we receive a partial allocation from Kachuma, it would serve as contingency supply and we would really carry it over to use next year, which is why you see a larger bar for Kachuma in 2018. The yellow bars are groundwater supplies, so this is what we've already produced for this water year, and then we'll be shutting the wells down and likely keeping them offline until 2019. Orange is imported water, and the assumptions on imported water in this chart are somewhat conservative. For 2018 and 19, we've assumed a 35% allocation, that may be a little low, particularly for next year. So um, we do have capacity to have more delivered, and if the allocations um, are th less than 35%, we'd be on the market looking for supplemental water purchases. Um, desal is the green, and then we have uh, extraordinary conservation throughout. This assumes a 30% conservation target for through the uh, next three years. As you can see, there's a small shortage in 2019, and we feel comfortable we can fill that um, with state water, either with a larger allocation that may come through or supplemental purchases. We have a couple of questions, Mr. White and then okay. Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so the capacity in is it 2017 or 2018, 2018, you're saying we have more capacity than you're showing that we're using there for importing water. That's correct. And we, we have the water in San Luis to deliver should we choose to do so. These projections don't assume, it only assumes what we already have. So we have some water in San Luis from previous years and then we've got our current year allocations. But what's shown in this sh chart uh, does not include any future supplemental water purchases, although we do have the pipe capacity to do that if we, uh, in order to fill the gap in 2019. And, and what, what, con what kind of quantity are we talking about? about that, if you look at those little bars, <clears throat> would that be 1,000 acre feet? extra that we have of capacity, something like that? Roughly, yes, <clears throat> that's and, correct. And w why wouldn't we, I'm imagining that water's gonna be cheap to buy now, relatively mm -hmm. speaking, so why wouldn't we be buying that water and bringing that in? You're just, you're just a, that would be something we might do opportunistically, but we're not gonna make that assumption, is that how you would? Madam Mayor, Council Member White, that's a great question. Um, the landscape has changed a bit since, uh, compared to the last few years when San Luis Reservoir was really low, there was a low okay. risk of spilling. Mm -hmm. um, so if we were to purchase additional water right now, most likely it would spill from San Luis. Um, okay. And I, the DWR is changing their policies somewhat to make a carryover of supplemental water purchases more difficult. Um, <laughs> so going forward, we may be looking for other types of water purchases not necessarily where we can plan, you know, purchase it now and use it several years out, but most likely the year in which we need it mm -hmm. and would be looking for water purchases that um, potentially come from outside of the state water contractors so that we don't have additional water debt that we've accrued by doing exchanges with other state water contractors. Um, so in summary, the main, the main thing that's changed is the ability to carry over water at San Luis, which is why we wouldn't purchase now and rely on it uh, go for the next few years. Okay, <clears throat> but there is potential. Uh, I can appreciate that it's it's more challenging than it, it was during the when when San Luis was mostly empty and when state regulations were less stringent. Um, the other piece is. Um, in your meetings with other uh, local staff, are you, are you hearing that more capacity is, is everybody else using their full cap uh, capacity of their conveyance as well? 
Yes, Madam Mayor, Council Member White, from what I've heard, everybody is maxing out their capacity right now um, and trying to move their water out of San Luis because of the spill risk. Uh, risk. Okay. Even going into next year, there's a risk of spill. Okay, and then finally, uh, the Alameda well, um, did that uh, see how, what's its condition? And I assume there's no chloride issues there, but at least how, what, are the, what are its levels? Are they the same as other? Uh, as the other wells? Yes, it's roughly the same. We still anticipate um, some yield available if we needed to turn the wells back on. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Just to, before going to Mr. Rouse, just to follow up on the San Luis Reservoir um, option. I mean, about um, six weeks ago, we were freaking out about losing the spill over if it would spill we'd lose the water we purchased and stored but now you're saying that we have that water or did we lose some there was some arrangement with MWD somewhere can you give me an update of what happened madam mayor yes um, we were very fortunate metropolitan water district um, out of the goodness of their hearts really um, found an arrangement for us to be able to transfer our water into their storage so we were able to preserve a portion of our carryover water. That was a three to two exchange. So we gave them three units of water, they'd give us two back. Um, we have not heard yet if any of that water spilled under Metropolitan's name. If it did, we'd lose a portion of it, um, but they're still working out the numbers, probably won't hear until May whether any of that spilled under Metropolitan's name. Okay. Um, so what, and how does that relate to what we're looking at here when you say San Luis water? You said the well, we believe that uh, all of that water from Metropolitan Water District has to, uh, has to be used this calendar year. So we're maxing out our pipeline deliveries to bring it to Kachuma and would use it um, here. So some of this is water that's stored in Kachuma that we could also carry over at Kachuma as well once it get, arrives there. Um, but it, these projections are based on the 60% allocation this year plus whatever we would get back from Metro, Metropolitan Water District. Uh, and next year would be a 35% allocation followed by another 35% allocation and that's all that's included in these projections. And was MWD's offer extended to Goleta and Montecito and Carpentria as well? Yes, there okay. were um, CC, uh, Central Coast Water Authority is who the agreement was with between CCWA and Metropolitan. I believe uh, about 10 of the agencies participated with CCWA and there was another uh, state water contractor that also participated so we weren't the only ones and um, during that time when our carryover water was under Metropolitan's name, they had to forego Article 21 deliveries, which is basically uh, water that becomes available when the reservoir is spilling. Um, and so they didn't receive as many of the Article 21 de deliveries as they would otherwise have had uh, if they didn't enter this agreement with us. So, um, so it, to some extent, uh, they lended us a favor in preserving a portion of our water supply. Got it. Well, thank you for pursuing it, and that's good. Okay, that helps. Mr. Rouse, and then Mr. Hotchkiss. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So, Mr. Dyer, we're obviously still dependent on exotic water sources to make up our water use budget, yet I'm hearing some rumors about potentially dire new biological report regarding fish releases in the future or fish supply for water. Uh, do you know much about that? Is it too early to, um, to tell what's going to go on? But it, it, there was a tremendous amount of water mentioned in the rumors that I heard and it just, it's, it's, it's chasing our tail to keep importing all this water and then blasting it off to the, the whims of NIMS, should we say. Um, I can't speak to what's in the draft biop. We have had a draft water rights order that w came out this year, um, and so we've evaluated the water supply impacts of that. Um, the 
the projections I have right now um, are based on what's in the reservoir today. So the it assumes about a 40% allocation in April and then a 40% allocation for next year and nothing after that. So um, there is a potential that our Kachuma yield could be reduced um, in, the, in the coming years uh, because of the draft biological opinion. It certainly has a potential to reduce the yield and um, sedimentation is also an issue that we'll need to address. Uh, the operational yield that we have was from a couple decades ago, and there's been some sedimentation since then that will have to be incorporated too. Well, yeah, I was taken aback because the, the amounts that I heard were almost two, double, or maybe even three times the amounts that we've had historically released. So I was concerned if we shouldn't be uh, talking to our federal friends sooner than later. Um, CCRB, the Kachuma Conservation Release Board is the agency that the city works with on those uh, issues. Um, so we're a member agency of CCRB and uh, certainly we'll have been following it and we'll be coming out with information at the right time. Mr. Hotchkiss? Um, maybe you answered it and I didn't get it, but did was there some spillage at San Luis so we actually lost water? Uh, Mayor, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Hutchkiss, there was a spill. We're not certain if uh, met, it, the water under Metropolitan's name, that was our water, right. we don't know if any of that spilled yet. So that's not, you're not going to hear until May on that one? Right. Okay, thank you. Mr. Uh, sorry, thank you, Madam Mayor. Two other questions. Um, Mr. Rouse's rumor mill also uh, indicated to me that there is water that we we're now required to release fish water now can you describe what what's going on with it that, with that now yes madam mayor councilmember white uh, we just received emails yesterday um, that nymphs has directed the bureau to begin fish releases again um, into Hilton Creek we don't know the amount, okay. um, but we do know that the lake level is not high enough for water to gravity flow over to Hilton Creek. And there's two ways to supply water by pumping over to Hilton Creek. One is a barge, which you may have seen out there. Um, we've been informed by the Bureau that the barge needs repair and is not operational. So as a result they would have to send water through the emergency backup pumping system which is through the outlet works at Bradbury Dam which affects our state water deliveries and so uh, there's a potential that our state water deliveries this week uh, would be interrupted and we find out more from CCWA on Thursday on this issue. The last time that this occurred, we were able to put in a bypass pipe up and over the dam. And so I expect we'll have a somewhat similar solution, but the, the Bureau has asked that we go farther into the lake. Um, they're concerned about the lake levels and potential for erosion with the previous route that we had. So I expect will be the state water deliveries will resume, um, and this won't really affect our current strategy. I think we had enough contingency to to buffer this, but um, it is an issue we're dealing with this week. Okay. So, uh, and then secondly, the uh, Gibraltar reservoir, the the numbers that you're using for Gibraltar, is that our maximum extraction that we are allowed to take out of Gibraltar at this point? Correct. Yes, we're limited um, by monthly diversions and annual diversions, so we are maxing out up to our monthly deliveries. For that 2018 year? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, no more questions for now. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so our, for our conservation target, our current target is 40%, and that was adopted in December and was intended to address the projected summer of 2017 shortages during peak demand periods. Um, we adopted lawn watering restrictions to help achieve that 40% 40, 40 target, and it was really preventative in case the rains were not sufficient. 
Um, the recent rains in February have alleviated our summer 2017 peaking issues, but we are still in a drought. And so uh, our staff recommendation is to revise the conservation target from 40% to 30% since the peaking issue has ceased. Um, and we expect that 30% conservation is sufficient based on our three-year water supply projections. Our current water use regulations, I'm just gonna go through these briefly. Um, watering is limited to evening and early morning hours. Watering during or 48, after, out 48 hours after rainfall is prohibited. Runoff or overspray is prohibited. Hoses must be used with a shot off nozzle. Commercial fountains over 25 square feet may not operate. No washing of pavement or other hard surfaces. Pools and spas must be covered when not in use. Drought notices required in lodging, restaurants, and gyms. Water is served only upon request, and watering lawns with potable water is prohibited. So these are the uh, regulations that we've been actively enforcing, um, and people have been very responsive to them. Um, our recommendation is to keep all the current water regulations, uh, given that we're still in a, in a drought, except for the mandatory lawn ban. Um, we would recommend, this, this is a staff recommendation that we would encourage um, policy that we go back to voluntary uh, encouragement of letting our lawns go. We, we don't want people to all of a sudden think, um, have a surge in lawn watering. We're basically back to where we were last fall, and we want to encourage it on a voluntary basis. It's just that we won't be assessing a fine if, if people are caught doing it. You have a question, Mr. Hart? Yeah, the last line on the previous slide, the watering lawns with potable water is prohibited. What does that mean? But if you have if you're a residential customer, that's all you have is potable water. That's our current regulation, which we're proposing that we remove at this time. Okay. And uh, I will say we uh, uh, discussed this with Water Commission on March 16th, and they supported the proposed conservation target of 30 percent, but recommended that the mandatory lawn ban stay in place. Okay, that previous slide's kind of confusing because there's things that are staying and things that are going and they're all listed on the same slide. So that's why I was uncertain about that. Let's see. So this is what's currently adopted, uh, this whole list, and we're proposing all remain uh, in place except for, except for the very last one. We have a list that has everything we're keeping. Okay. It's just there to remind people what they are. I see, okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So I have Madeline Ward, our water conservation supervisor, here with me today um, to talk about briefly the some of the programs in our water conservation. Madam group. Mayor, may I? Sorry. Go ahead. What was the Water Commission's... Um, reasons for saying to keep the water, the lawn ban in place? I, th I think they're concerned that we're still in a drought and didn't um, want our, our demands to rebound too quickly. Um, we're, we've still got a ways to go. Um, but I think um, We'll be monitoring this closely, and we'd still have a strong message for voluntary uh, actions to let the people's lawns go. This is something we've always had as part of our water conservation message over time for many years, and so we'll con continue with the messaging of how to reduce your water use and ways that are easy to um, reduce both your water use and your water bill, those have always been something we've encouraged and uh, I want to have Madeline Ward, our water conservation supervisor, to touch on some of the messaging she does with lawn watering because that's certainly something we emphasize for ways to reduce your water use. Okay, but don't be offended if I agree with the Water Commission. Thanks. Um, go ahead, Mr. Dominguez. The, uh, I have a question about the water supply slide, page 10. Do you know the approximate prices of the water sources? 
I, well, roughly, um, there, are you asking from a variable cost dollar per acre foot perspective on whether we use the water, what is the cost whether we use the water or not, or the total cost with the Well, let me explain why I'm asking, and maybe that'll help um, you decide which method to use, but in terms of the watering of lawns, if we're going to add it, that back in, what is that going to cost ratepayers? What is it going to cost the city? Is that going to be the most expensive water that we're buying? Is it going to be the cheapest water? It's a good question, M Madam Mayor, Councilmember Dominguez. Um, our conservation target does factor into our water rates, um, as you know. The most, the majority of our revenue is volumetric charges. And so um, as we calculate the unit price for our volumetric charges, we have to factor in projected water use. And so a higher conservation target makes that unit price higher because we have to recover the same amount of revenue with less water usage. Um, I would say that our alternative would be supplemental water purchases. Um, and it's more cost effective to go out and purchase additional water than to um, rely on, have a extraordinary conservation. The effect on our water rates would be more for, for conservation than it would be to go out and buy supplemental water purchases. And that's really just, it depends on the market at the time and what's happening around the state? Correct. Do you have an estimate of how much it would cost? Well, it's it's been very cost effective in the last year. We've been able to secure water with uh, Antelope Valley, East Kern, AVEC. Um, that was $300 an acre foot, or it's, it ranges um, anywhere from 300 to $1,000 an acre foot for the purchase price. And once our desal plan is operating, what's gonna be the operating cost per acre foot? $1,400 an acre foot. So if we don't water lawns and we can avoid maxing out some of those desal costs, will that positively impact ratepayers? Or is there enough supplemental purchase potential that it makes the desal plant less of a factor? I th are you asking if um, if we turn down, if we have more conservation and turn down the desal production, if that would be more cost effective? Well, the, the general question I'm asking is, is what's it going to cost ratepayers if if we water lawns? Because that's going to be a significant number of acre feet. What's what's your guesstimate of how many acre feet we'd add back into our demand if we turn off lawn bans? So, so uh, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Dominguez, ultimately lifting the lawn ban, um, reducing our conservation goal is going to take the pressure off our unit cost of water, ultimately. And I'm it, not asking about the unit price because that really varies household to household. But I'm no. asking about the, and you're talking about unit price to the customer or unit price in terms of your purchasing ability? No, no the unit price to the customer. So it's going to make those units of water more affordable, if you want to put it that way, if more people are using water. Our, our cost, our 80 percent of our costs of operating this water system are pretty much fixed. And so if we have more customers using water, it reduces the amount of revenue we need to bring in per unit of water sold. And so by having this, lifting the turf grass ban, by reducing our conservation target, um, you know, we're kind of just trying to strike that balance. If we have the water available, being able to sell it ultimately lowers those costs. So for those people who use and live on fixed incomes, it should help to reduce the pressure on their, their water bill. So people who are watering lawns will pay more into the system. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that will overcome the, uh, the possibly more expensive water that has to be purchased or paid for because people are watering lawns and the, the demand goes up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Madam Mayor, members of the council, my name is Madeline Ward. I'm the water conservation supervisor. 
As always, the city is here to help uh, all of our customers better understand how water is used on their property and how to reduce water use. The, our most popular program is what's called a free water checkup. It's available for all uh, customers, whether you're a home, business, industrial, complex, any of the above, we're happy to come out and help you take a look around your property, help you read your water meter, and determine um, any leaks you may have. This is National Fix-A-Leak Week, so I encourage you to test your toilets especially for any hidden leaks, and we have a lot of great information on our website about how to find and identify hidden leaks. We have a variety of very popular programs in terms of rebate programs. Uh, one of the ones that we've had since 2009 that's been very popular during the drought is our landscape rebate for replacing high water use plants such as lawns and or uh, high water use irrigation systems. We also have a rebate on high efficiency washing machines. Those old top loader machines use about 30 gallons per load and the new front loading machines use about eight to 10 gallons per load. So there's considerable savings there. We have a rebate on pool covers. We have free sprinkler nozzle program, a free mulch delivery of the county's mulch two times a year per customer, and free rain shutoff sensors, which would come in very handy today. This is a before and after that I like to highlight. Um, these are two different properties that went through our landscape rebate program. The top property is the Santa Barbara Association of Realtors building that's on Chapala Street. And if you're ever in the area, I encourage you to take a look at the garden and walk through. We have a great demonstration garden sign and you can identify some of the features um, since it is a rain garden and they've redirected their downspouts. So when it was an existing lawn, they used to water the lawn three times a week. And with the new rain garden, they water it three times a year. This is a great study that was done by Santa Monica College and they compared two different landscapes side by side for a year. And as you can see, it's not only just considerable water savings, but it's also savings in terms of green waste that's produced and maintenance hours. Sustainable landscapes generally just need a bit of a nip and tuck each year. They don't need considerable mowing and blowing. Okay, so our next steps um, will determine our conservation target um, which is then used to estimate our projected water use for next year and would be applied for into FY18 water rates. Um, and we will continue to monitor our supplies and demands with monthly drought updates to both Water Commission and Council. So our recommendation is that Council adopt a resolution establishing a revised 30% water conservation target and updated water use regulations effective during a stage three drought emergency. And those regulations were included in the council packet and it's uh, keeping all regulations the same with the exemption of the lawn ban, which would be removed. Okay, thank you. We do have some public comment. Why don't we go to that? We'll uh, have Lindsay Baker and then Scott Wentz. Madam Mayor, council members. Lindsay Baker, League of Women Voters. I've spoken to you in the past regarding our support of banning lawn watering. You heard seven times it stated today that we are still in a drought, that we are planning for two more dry years and three years of extraordinary conservation. We are still in a drought today. The League of Women Voters is actively involved in water issues. We have a water committee. We've hosted a presentation by the water manager from Ventura on potable water use. We've hosted presentations by members of the Goleta Water District. We are studying water regionally. We attend the water commission meetings. In a recent brochure from the Goleta Water District, it stated that reducing lawn watering saves the most amount of water. As I've stated before, Santa Barbara is a Mediter Mediterranean climate. A Mediterranean climate means long, dry summers and droughts. Reducing watering lawns saves water. This is an opportunity to change the mentality 
of the people in Santa Barbara. Bless you. They are already having, making changes to water conservation plants in their yards. They've already accepted that lawn watering has been banned. This is not the time to reverse that decision. Thank you. Mr. Wentz. Madam Mayor, members of the council, I own commercial property just over here by Santa Barbara High School. The last major drought, I turned off the outside water a year before the city required it to be turned off. This year, this term, I shut it off and we've been off for two years before the city wanted us to t stop outside watering. So I want you to understand, I understand this. I was also heavily invested in Ionic Exchange Water Purification Company, so I know a little bit about what's going on here. I urge you to allow us to water lawns a minimum of once a week. Now, <laughs> people say, well, it's counterintuitive. The, the, uh, the uh, Board of Realtors was watering the lawn three times a week. Well, there's no, re no need for that. A well-maintained lawn can go a minimum of two times a week, and with proper care, probably once a week. Lawns are high oxygen producing items. They produce as much as any tree we have. They also are a high carbon binding plant, which means every time that lawn grows, it's binding carbon and reducing the carbon footprint. So if the city can continue using potable water, which it has been using on Annapamu Street for the stone pines, then you should be able to allow us to do that. Thank you. To the council. So there are two items. One is the conservation rate down to 30%, and then I guess it's the issue of um, rescinding the mandatory water ban. Um, Mr. White. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, well, I will. I certainly support the, the staff recommendations, but I also want to appreciate the League of Women Voters over the years. Uh, I can remember back to the previous drought that uh, even at that time, uh, the, the League was, was weighing in uh, month in, month out, year in, year out with, with just, uh, and that really is uh, the core of what has gotten our conservation uh, rates in this city down f over the long term, not just uh, for this drought, but coming out of that last drought, we dropped our water use and we never did get anywhere near back to the consumption that we had prior to the last drought. So, um, and I, I feel like the, uh, the points that uh, Mr. Dominguez were was was uh, drilling down on that that the cost to the consumer uh, is uh, lower if there's a, a, a bit more consumption, and uh, frankly, it may help uh, the land values and the, the, just our real estate is dependent on on having uh, the ability to water uh, um, a little more freedom in that area. So, with that in mind, I I uh, move that the council. Uh, re pass the resolution uh, as outlined by staff and repeal resolution 1673, which was the lawn watering ban. Second. Okay, moved by White, second by Rouse. Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, this is why I always, always don't look forward to having to explain the logic behind water rates to constituents because there's, it's like following the, the proverbial pretzel. Um, you know, at one point in time, we were talking about how the saved water was the, was the was the cheapest water we could get, and of course, there's always that that fine line between when nobody buys water and now we have to go into our water reserves and then raise raise blah blah blah. So anyway, uh, I do agree with the League of Women Voters stance in terms of not watering lawns, and I think most people have that at least at least what I observe have adopted something along those lines. I don't necessarily think it takes an ordinance to do it, however. Uh, Mr. Hagmark talked from time to time about drought fatigue amongst our, our clientele, our constituents out there. And I agree with that. And I think there's been an esprit de corps in this community that's always risen above everything we've asked them to do. They've always exceeded our, our whatever we've either mandated or asked for. Um, our, our citizens aren't children. They, they get this. They're not going to run out and start you know, planting uh, acres and acres of sod tomorrow based on this. Everybody still realizes there is a drought 
even though it's raining. I think the work that Ms. Ward does in terms of information and alternatives is really valuable. I think it's been really successful. Um, I agree with this motion. I think that we can completely uh, at least allow for a little bit of relief from the drought fatigue, even though been still realizing and still communicating that we are in fact in a drought, but still have the same effective uh, way of, um, of uh, going forward and, and enhancing our city and hopefully bringing back some of our water funds that are so, so greatly depleted at this point in time. Ms. Murillo. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, with all due respect to staff and their recommendation, I'm persuaded that we're still in a severe drought and that, um, or I know that's a term of art, we're still in a drought. And um, uh, I see the red in your um, chart and I just know we need to conserve water. And um, I might be persuaded to go to 30%, but I would still like to keep the, the ban on the lawn watering <clears throat> in place. So I'll just vote no on since the two items are together in the, um, uh, in the motion. Uh, I would like people to start using, doing something differently with their outdoors. And we need to do that long term. So thank you. Mr. Hart. Yeah, I think my path to supporting the staff recommendation and the motion is the simple fact that when we enacted the lawn ban, it was to uh, address a 700 acre foot shortage that was gonna come up this summer that was extraordinary and unplanned for outside of our multi-year planning effort. And now events have changed to fill that gap more than five times that. Um, and that it, it just makes sense to be consistent with the policy that we had before that occasion arised because it has been addressed to remove the lawn watering ban. But the message remains the same, which is that residents should continue to conserve and they were conserving before that, that event. And um, I have great confidence they will continue to conserve. One little detail that is new in the presentation today, for the first time I saw this, is the charts on slides 11 and 12 that show the recharge of the groundwater basins. And one thing I think is important to kind of fine tune the messaging on is that the staff report and the, the charts talk about there being a five to 10 year period to recharge the water basins. And yet the charts don't show that. It's not um, the recovery, maybe I'm looking at the wrong slides on my chart then. Um, maybe go to 12. It's easier to see. Yes, those. The recovery it looks more to me like you're at 80 to 90 percent recovery after two to three years. That last, it's maybe one of those long tail situations where it takes a very long time to recover to 100 percent. But those charts to me look like you get back very quickly, much more quickly than that five to 10 year horizon would indicate. So I'd like a little bit more explanation for that. Uh, well, storage unit one does rebound more quickly. It is a um, more confined aquifer, so it responds more quickly to pumping. When we turn our pumping on, it dramatically reduces, and then when we turn it off, it dramatically goes back up. Um, so I guess it depends on you know how far you, are you go. If you go out, um, if you go out, say this far, it was about a five-year recovery. Um, I guess if you are looking from the low point all the way out to when it gets to fully recovered, it was about five years. It mm -hmm. could be less, um, but this is just our example of what happened in the last drought. I guess the only point I'm raising is that it just it gives a different impression when you say that it takes five to ten years to recover. It almost sounds like it doesn't start recovering until about five years, but it really recovers most of its capacity fairly quickly, which is a different impression than that five to 10 year horizon. So I think that's just something to, as part of the communication of a really complicated subject to the public, I think this is a, a nuance that's important. Lots of people I think, think that you know, we can't use the groundwater again for another 10 years. Mm. That's the implication I think that comes from that. It takes five to 10 years to recover the basin, as opposed to, no, that's not the case, that we could go back if we had to add that on the water supply um, seven year program and see that we're, we would actually go back and use groundwater within a couple of years if we needed to. Madam Mayor, Council Member Hart, that's a great point. Um, if we get a, a couple of normal rainfall years that helps to recharge our groundwater basins, if we have extremely dry years, we may not right. see as much recovery. Um, but yes, this is really showing that in storage unit one, after five years, it's fully recovered. And mm -hmm. in between there, it's partially recovered. 
for Foothill Basin, it was 10 years before it was fully recovered, but mm -hmm. again, in the near term, it can have some partial recovery. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hotchkiss. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think it's important to pass this uh, as a reflection that we uh, appreciate what people have done, and it really does have an effect. If we don't, they're just going to be like, well, why do we try so hard? Not, not, nothing making, not making anything better for us. So if for no other reason than to say well done, then that's why we should pass this. Mr. Dominguez? So I'd be much happier if, if we maybe structured the motion so that we pass it, but contingent on a few things happening between now and the end of the month or maybe mid-April because it seems like there's a lot of unknowns. We don't know about the water spillage with, with the Metropolitan Water District. When would we know dispositively? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, mid-May is when we're told that we'll have the final numbers. Right now there's a discrepancy where Metropolitan was showing that a portion of the water spilled, not all of it, but a small portion, and DWR was showing that nothing had spilled. So they're reconciling the numbers and we'll know in mid-May. Um, exactly what happened but I do expect we'll get some water returned uh, even using the metropolitan water numbers um, we'd still get some of our water back so there's the worst case scenario is there we we would lose all of those units um, I think worst case is we'd get a thousand acre feet back out of the roughly 4,500 that we put in and which number does that correlate to on slide 20 or it looks like the water supply strategy slide. Oh, I guess I'm on the other way. One more is the one I'm. This one? No, it was, let's see. Well, you could show me on that one. Where does the either the 4,500 or 1,000 map, which color? It's the orange bar. So this is partially our 60% um, allocation from this year, plus whatever we, you know, assuming a 1,000 acre feet from um, Metropolitan. S we also have over 2,000 acre feet already in Kachuma. There's state water, uh, the city's state water already in Kachuma. So um, the combi combination of those three, our current year allocation, what we get from Mo Metropolitan, what we already have in Kachuma, it makes up the orange bar. For a water year six? For, yes, water year, year six, um, and then whatever we don't use can be carried over to future years. Okay, and the uh, where are we with the Montecito uh, agreement. Is that something that we'd know more about in a month? Do you want to speak to that, Mr. Ha Hegwick? Madam, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Dominguez, uh, the board is actually discussing the water supply agreement today at their board meeting. And so we'll, uh, at this point, they are still weighing whether they want to participate in the cost of the conveyance pipeline, which is the only method to ensure that water can be delivered to them. And so we're basically waiting to hear what they have to say on that. Mr. Casey? Councilmember Dominguez, I, 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 staff's recommendation is based upon the information we have today. I think we've shown that we're not shy returning to council if we have a dramatic change one way or the other and adjust conservation efforts and approaches based upon that. So I want to assure you that if something changes in a matter of months or whatever, we'll be back to you and have that conversation and recommend some adjustments if we feel that's necessary. So my theory is, and I'm only halfway through the list, is there's enough unknowns now where I hate to say start watering and then a month later saying stop watering. So that's that's kind of the point I'm, I'm going to eventually make quickly. Um, regarding the desal, so if, if what are the options then with the conveyance or where are we planning now of uh, where's the water going to be delivered from the desal plant? Madam Mayor, Councilmember Dominguez, uh, we are planning to basically put it right into our existing distribution system, which does have the ability to take the full 3,000 acre feet a year um, without any type of additional conveyance pipeline. It's when we talk about additional capacity or the need to convey it to Montecito where we need to have that pipeline in place. 
and maybe it might help you out with your um, your question that you're getting at, which is, you know, is it premature? And I, I think what we can say is that we have adequate supplies going forward that we know for this year we are certainly covered and 30% conservation will get there. Under the worst case scenario, we could be looking at maybe some modifications next year, but we're thinking even based on, I think, some conservative assumptions, 30% is gonna be adequate for next year. So really, I don't see us having to run back here and make any modifications this year. Um, we have uh, a pretty sizable, a 40% allocation of Kachuma that we are planning to get and planning to use next year. That water could be used this year if for some reason there was some dramatic change. But um, I feel like we actually, unlike last year, we actually have some contingency water to work with right now that allows us to move things around and not be in a position where we're running back to have to change the conservation goals. I, I yeah, it's night and day from last yeah. year. <laughs> we all appreciate <laughs> two that. Two months ago. <laughs> the, uh, and the 2019, that little red spot, one, it's, it's smallish and it's two years off. But again, that's something that uh, even hearing maybe about the fish release numbers that, that the other council member raised. And um, I would like to find out what we could do more about the volumetric versus the fixed costs in terms of how it impacts rate payers. So that would give us some time to study that. Yes, and, and what's key, I think, to making kind of this, getting this direction today, is we're gonna turn right around and now start working on the rates, because the rate, the water rates are now gonna be built around this, which will allow us to come back to you and have more of that rate discussion, which I think you're eager to probably get in and talk about. Um, and uh, there's a, certainly a lot of work to be done on that if we're gonna get those adopted by August. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'm gonna. Because of the, uh, the uncertainty of some of these and the pricing, I'm going to say no today. But uh, again, if it was something that would come back in a month, I would probably vote yes if these unknowns became more green than red. So the purpose of the lawn watering ban when we did it was because, and I think Mr. Hart said it well, uh, was that we were expecting a shortfall of water this summer because we didn't know it was gonna rain as much as it did when we instituted the ban in December, mm -hmm. right? So now that it has rained and that we have the water that you have put in here that you expect to have through this rest of this water year, we don't have that shortfall in the summer, um, that, right? That was the rationale behind the watering ban. That is correct, Madam Mayor, it was a shortage and it wasn't a shortage of actually having water. It was available being able to actually deliver those waters during those peak it's months. It's sort of like months. cash flow issues. Everybody, yes, yeah, exactly. Month to month, and mm -hmm. in the high peak year uh, months, <laughs> you needed that water. Mm -hmm. So just to go along the line, um, to, to just carry through with what Mr. Dominguez was saying, worst case scenario of some of these unknowns, I guess the question is, do you still, if the worst case scenario happened um, with San Luis water, with fish releases with all those things, would you expect a shortfall this summer or not? Madam Mayor, this summer I don't, I wouldn't expect a shortfall this summer. Okay, even even if the unknowns got to your, you in the worst case scenario? Correct, we're primarily using our Gibraltar water this year and so that makes up the majority of our water supply. So, so the difference between December and now is really Gibraltar. We didn't, because it wasn't filled, we can, we can use that, that's the gap that we're talking about mm -hmm. here that we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I, I, think, I think the messaging is important that we said up front because of the shortfall, we really need to ratchet up even more. And if that's not necessary, let's not um, stretch out extreme measures of water conservation, but still keep the message about water conservation in general, which is important. So 30% is still significant. Mm -hmm. And in fact, probably more than most places around the state. In fact, most places around the state don't even have a drought anymore. So, so, um, so it, it, and if it got to a point where we would see a shortage into the future, we can come back and look at um, a, a lawn watering ban again. As I said, when we implemented, if it's raining, you don't need to water your lawn anyway, and mm -hmm. it's been raining. So, uh, you know, I think that's going to answer some of the concerns. So, I, I appreciate what Council Members Mario and Dominguez are where they're coming from, but I think to be honest with why we put together the ban in the first place was to address this particular shortfall that no longer exists, then it makes sense to say 
we don't need the ban anymore, but still really push for water conservation, which I know we will. So I, I can um, I can appreciate where you're where you're coming from here, and I and I appreciate where the water commission was because they want to make sure that we never get back to where we were. But um, I think the facts have changed since uh, December, and we've been always working on doing the best we can with the facts we have in front of us. So um, so it, it, so I, I'm I'm okay with this resolution, knowing that I hear from you that worst case scenario of the unknowns, we'll still have enough water to cover the summer, um, which was the whole rationale behind the water ban. So, so, so Madam Mayor, I mean, it's, I spoke on March 7th about this with you. It's, it's really interesting. We're trying to strike a balance here and recognizing that really February 17th was uh, a pretty turning point, a significant turning point without that one event that occurred on February 17th, we would be looking at basically the same years that we've been having over the last five years. It was that significant. It came when a watershed was finally wet, and then we got that 10 inch rain event. Without that, it, it, it doesn't look too, diff too different from what we've seen in the past. And so we're trying to strike that balance and recognizing that yes, we do have addition much more water than we had had, but really climate wise we haven't seen a significant change locally here in what we've been looking at so this is kind of a addressing the drought fatigue striking some balance recognizing that if we need to go back to this community and ask for more conservation there's there's they respect and trust that we are looking at it and watching it closely so it, it is a um, you know it's a fine dance but it, we've been so fortunate this community has been really responsive to when we ask for something they, they've been there for us so okay mr white Thank you, Madam Mayor. Two points. Uh, one is that that 30 percent conservation number is 30 percent conservation of a base use rate that is one of the lowest in the state. Uh, we have a conservation program which has Im baked in uh, uh, low water use in a, in a host of ways. It started in 25 years ago. It was toilet rebates and such like. And we now have, uh, and the staff has has worked on a very rational uh, program of what's the next place where money can be invested in conservation, and uh, we're getting the, the, the long-term benefits of that. So that 30% is not 30% of the state average number by any means. We, we win gold stars for our base program, and that 30% is on top of that excellent record. So um, that's to be noted. And then I wanted to uh, add something to Mr. Hart's uh, uh, conversation about the wells, and that is that while there's a there's a, a vertical rise in in uh, in groundwater that you see in those in those maps, what you don't see is the pushback, and particularly in Basin One, we have the chlorides that invade from the co from the ocean, and we need to and that it's the high, it's the pressure the hydrostatic pressure that pushes those salts back out, and that's the where it, it really slows down. Uh, and, and what we've benefited from, even with a change of program over the last, uh, from 25 years ago, we used to just pump the heck, probably even in your earliest days on council. We used those wells all the time, and we're always, uh, we were more vulnerable. We've now got more of a program where we, we've uh, pushed those chlorides further back out. Okay. Um, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Opposed. Okay, so that's 5-2 with Dominguez and Murillo opposed. All right, thank you very much. Move on to item 7.